Good evening. Great. I don't know why my voice broke like, like I'm 16 or something. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome to the People's University Dinosaurs. Um, before we get started tonight, we have a very special guest. <laughs> Music and everything. So we thought that might be appropriate for her to visit. Next Tuesday, August 30th, Hal Gorby and I will present uh, the George Washington of Labor's Cause. That was one of the nick many nicknames for uh, Augustus Pollock. We'll tell you all about his life and beyond, which is most important for him. Next Thursday in this class, Dr. A.R. West, our first instructor from the University of Pittsburgh ever in this series or any other. Uh, will tell us about the end, the sad end of the dinosaur and the rise of our people, the mammals. Okay. Now again, the first 20 people I said at the beginning, if you make it to every class, you get priority in terms of going to the field trip. So you should be signing in. I still have some copies of Mouse upstairs if you're interested in that on September 20, the panel discussion. Next week, I'll talk more about the trip to Carnegie, uh, which will happen in two weeks. So uh, we'll get all the uh, details sorted out. Our instructor this evening, again, is Taylor McCoy. He's a vertebrate paleontology volunteer at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History under Dr. Matt Lamana. His experience there includes community outreach through science communication and fossil restoration. He also has field experience working with Dr. Thomas Carr in Montana excavating and prospecting fossils from the late Cretaceous, and also the Jurassic. Yeah. Here he is, Taylor McCoy. All right, well, let me just start off with saying, if you're gonna make, if you get to the Carnegie, yeah, that's a top priority, that's a, that's a good trip. Um, and I'm not biased at all. Um, <laughs> so, tonight, our main subject of, is going to be, you know, flight in, in the natural world. Now, whenever I say flight, specifically we're talking power of flight. Animals being able to take off and fly under their own power. You know, we have flying squirrels and even some snakes that can do some gliding, but we're talking actual, you know, power of flight with their wings. Um, and there's going to be a few different groups, one that we're going to be focusing on in particular, but getting right into it. Um, the ability to, to fly is fairly rare in vertebrates. Um, it's pretty common in insects. We have a lot of flying insects, but for the backbone animals, it's only really appeared in three groups. Um, the first flying animals were insects. Uh, they appeared in the fossil record somewhere around 325 million years ago, so long before the dinosaurs or anything like that. Some of the ones that appeared during the period called the Carboniferous um, were absolutely enormous. Insects in general during this time were really big and they were high oxygen levels compared to today, which allowed them to grow to larger sizes. Um, the one species in particular was called Meganeura, which is an ancient griffin fly, something similar to a modern day dragonfly, only this one had a wingspan of about two feet. Um, 
So thinking of a dragonfly the size of a hawk or a large crow flying around, and it would have been a voracious, when I say little predator, not so much little for, for a bug. So if you don't like bugs, do not travel 320 million years ago. You're going to have a really bad time. Um, so while they were the first creatures to develop flight and start buzzing around, they were definitely not the last. Um, when the Mesozoic rolls around, which happened during the Triassic period, reptiles really started to take over. The Permian extinction that, start, that was, uh, had occurred before that had left a lot of these uh, ecological niches wide open, and reptiles really took, took advantage. Um, and that's when we start getting things like the first dinosaurs appear, uh, relatives of crocodilians, so all sorts of creatures. Um, in particular, the pterosaurs, like, like we had Amanda dancing around earlier. Um, they were the first vertebrates or creatures with a backbone to be able to fly. Um, they are related to dinosaurs. They aren't dinosaurs, but they are of the same reptilian group that includes them, uh, most closely related to dinosaurs and crocodilians. Um, they appeared during the Triassic about 230, 240 million years ago. Um, their appearance is very sudden. There's actually very few fossils of what the earliest pterosaurs and their relatives look like. Um, so that's a bit of a gap in the fossil record. We basically have full-on pterosaurs and very little in terms of what their closest relatives that still weren't pterosaurs would have been, other than knowing that they are the same group as crocs and dinosaurs. Um, they were super diverse, really successful. Um, the picture on my slide is a little small, but they were um, they were just everywhere and found on pretty much every continent, and they ranged in size from Little little guys with 12, 18 inch wingspans to uh, the famous pteranodon with the big crest on the back of its head. It had a wingspan of about 6 meters or 20 feet. Um, and that's only fairly large. Um, larger species did exist. Um, Quetzalcoatlus from North America is one of the most famous. Uh, it had a wingspan of about 11 meters, which is 36 feet across. So think of it flying reptile the size of a small airplane. And that is not an exaggeration. Um, and it wasn't the only one. There were multiple species to get wingspans in the ballpark of 30 to almost 40 feet. Uh, but these were the dominant creatures of the, of the Mesozoic skies, um, feeding on anything from fish to small dinosaurs, um, insects. They were, they were a highly, highly successful group. Um, I have some pictures on the slides. Um, the one in the top middle is a little, is a relatively small species called Ramphorhynchus. It's from the Jurassic period. Um, it has a wingspan of about six feet or so, so similar to a typically sized eagle or vulture. And we think of those as large birds today. And this was small to medium size for a pterosaur. Uh, Pteranodon on the, on the far corner. The one in the bottom is uh, in the middle is one of my favorites. It's called Tropiognathus. It has this big crest on its nose, and then another one on the lower jaw. Um, when they close their their, their bit, uh, jaws, they would have kind of made a circle shape. Um, that one's the, one of the largest from South America. And then the model in the bottom corner is of Quetzalcoatlus. Um, there's a silhouette of a T-Rex behind it to show that this animal was every bit as tall, if not taller, than Tyrannosaurus rex. And whenever it would land. It was the height of a giraffe at about 15 feet. And tucked between its wings in this picture are some people getting a picture with it. They really get lost in the overall size of this animal. It, it's incredible that something this big could even get off the ground. They were super lightweight. Their bones were hollow. Um, everything about their skeleton was designed to be lightweight. The Ramparinka skeleton there with the wing membranes preserved really illustrate how their wings were designed. They were actually flapping around on their pinkies. So if you take your hand, basically get rid of your thumb and just elongate your pinky and then stretch skin from that down to your ankles, that's what a pterosaur wing was. So a little bit more like a bat wing than a bird wing, um, but just one finger supporting the whole thing. Um, and the fact that these things were flying around in some cases with wings, wingspans in excess of 30 feet, most of that being pinky, is that is a strong, Strong little finger they had there. Um, the pterosaurs, they, they lived right alongside the dinosaurs for the entirety of the Mesozoic. Um, and like I said, they were the first vertebrate flyers. Um, 
in the fossil record. But they weren't going to be the last, and they weren't alone in those skies. Um, arguably the most famous flying animals are birds, and we have anywhere between 10 to 18,000 living species, um, really successful, really diverse on every continent. Um, the first true birds are what are called aves, avians. Um, they appear in the fossil record during the late Cretaceous, about 72 million years ago. These are what we consider you know, the group that includes modern birds. But they don't necessarily just show up there. We have their, their lineage goes way further back with bird groups that we don't have to this day. They're extinct now, um, and their earliest relatives. So even though our modern birds and the, have appeared during the late Cretaceous, they can trace their, their line even further back. And it has and it has roots embedded in the, uh, one of the, the most famous group of extinct animals of all time. And these lines between birds and what would be determined to be their closest relatives really started to become clear with the discovery of Archaeopteryx. It's a fairly famous animal, uh, discovered in 1861. Um, it's often called the first bird. It's not necessarily a true bird, but it's it's of that general lineage. Um, it was from the late Jurassic, about 150 million years old. Um, it really showed this hodgepodge of features that connected it between reptiles and what we would think of as birds. Um, it has a long tail, it has teeth in its, in its jaws, things that are typically think, thought of as reptilian. It's, it had wings, but it had these little claws from its fingers still sticking out. Uh, but it had those bird features, it had feathers, it had flight feathers in particular, the, the asymmetrical shape that our modern flying birds have. And that really helped clear things up in terms of where do birds fall on the family tree of, 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 of animal life, who are they most closely related to? Because this thing is essentially a reptile mixed with a bird. And even though in the Archaeopteryx was the first feathered animal to be to be named and found, but it wouldn't be the last. A um, number of fossils found in China, North America, and Europe have, have continued to fill in those gaps. Um, in particular, Archaeopteryx, for example, was found in Europe and Germany. Um, some of the fossil casts I brought with me tonight from the Carnegie there of some uh, there are some Chinese fossils, um, and to. After Archaeopteryx, to everyone's relative surprise, birds were, were connected to the, the ruling reptiles of the Mesozoic, the dinosaurs. So, you know, in the illustration, we have a chicken and bird and, uh, and a velociraptor <laughs> because those were all, you know, close relatives of each other, relatively speaking. Um, some of these feathery fossils are absolutely beautifully preserved. Um, the ones I have pictured here in the Top, in the top left corner is a dinosaur called Anchiornis. Um, it's a little feathered dinosaur. It has these beautiful feathered impressions around it. This is one dinosaur that we were actually able to determine the color of um, based off of the, um, the tiny little fossil melanosomes and pigment shapes that were found in its fossils. It was more or less black with little white um, in the mix and red on red crest on its head based off the shape of those pigments. Um, the dinosaur fossil below it in the bottom corner is another one that the color was determined. Um, that one is Sinoceropteryx. That one's ginger with a banded tail and a little banded mask around its eyes. Um, so kind of like an orange raccoon. <laughs> but uh, again, another covered in uh, downy feathers. The I'm going to skip the one, the, the one in the middle and go to the far, the far right, that's Sinernithosaurus, another feathered dinosaur. Um, a lot of these started being found in the 90s, is when a lot of these fossils started coming to life. Um, and then the one in the middle, that one's a really cool one called Microraptor. I have a little um, cat, uh, replica of its skull. The whole animal would have been maybe two feet or so. So a very small animal. It had four wings one on each arm, and then one on each leg. It probably wasn't capable of flight, flight super well. It probably could do something between gliding and flying, where it, was, it would get a little bit of power going, and then, but it, but it wouldn't have been able to fly nearly as well as uh, modern birds could. 
then I have some life reconstructions of these four animals. Um, so there's the Anchiornis with its black and white and red colors, the Cynoceropteryx with its um, orange and white, the Cynomythosaurus, and then um, in the top corner and then in the bottom we have the Microraptor. Microraptor is another one where they were able to figure the colors out and it would be like an iridescent black and blue, kind of like, pretty much like a crow. Um, so these were all relatively small, very bird-like dinosaurs. Um, some of the ones from North America that had been found were a little bit more distantly related to, to these guys. They're called ornithomimids. Um, so they're basically big, ostrich-looking dinosaurs. Um, long neck um, and tail, big legs, would have been built for speed. Um, there was a fossil of one called ornithomimus, which means bird mimic. Um, you know, found out out west, and it, it was just, again, covered in feathers with these big display wings. It was too big to fly, but it had wing-shaped structures basically made that its feathers were building up on its arms. Um, so all across the world, across different continents, we have feathered dinosaurs, and many of which having feathers in the right shapes to, to uh, start heading for something that would have been akin to flight. Um, now, are feathers the only thing that connect birds and dinosaurs? Um, no, there's actually more similarities and differences between birds and dinosaurs. Um, pretty much everything we see in a modern bird probably showed up in a dinosaur first. Um, they have hollow bones. The closest relatives of, bird, of birds are the theropod dinosaurs. Um, they all have hollow bones. Even the T-Rex behind me is big and is strong as these animals were, their bones were made up more of air than anything. Um, and that's a trait that birds take advantage of to help keep them lightweight and fly around. Um, it'll, for dinosaurs, it allowed some of them to get really big without being too big to move. Our biggest, land, our biggest animals today are in the oceans because the water really helps support their weight. Um, but if you're going to be on land, you need to find other ways around that. Hollow bones are a good way to do that. Um, in a similar sense, they have these air sac breathing systems. Dinosaur bones are just filled with these air sac, uh, well, I should say theropods and sauropods um, are filled with air sac systems. And birds also have these, again, helps lighten the load. It really helps in, the, in breathing and getting in as much oxygen as possible. It's a highly efficient way to breathe is to have not just lungs, but air sacs to help really even take, just keep, take it to the next level. They were also egg layers. Um, that's a trait all reptiles have in common. Um, brooding is another one that's, that's really interesting. Birds today, they sit on their nest, they, they incubate their eggs, they, they exhibit strong parental care. There's a story behind the fossil in the picture here. This is what's called an oviraptor. Oviraptor means egg thief, because when the skeleton was first discovered and it was found with all these eggs around it, it was presumed to be an omnivorous dinosaur looking for an easy meal, stealing some eggs, and it had died while doing so. And that, poor, that poor animal had a case of mistaken identity for decades before it was realized that was not a thief, but a caring parent. When they actually looked at the eggs, they determined that these were oviraptor eggs, and that the animal, quote, stealing them were act was actually most likely the parent looking to protect them. And it wouldn't be the last example of this. The number of um, brooding dinosaurs, mainly over after skeletons, um, have been found with these with the, these eggs and clutches underneath the parent, looking to protect them. Likely buried during a sandstorm. Um, so it's a sad, kind of a sad ending for them. Uh, but it really gives us great insight into the behavior of these animals. So whether it's physical, anatomical traits, or the behaviors exhibited by birds. They can all be traced back 65 plus million years ago into dinosaurs. Um, some of them were traits that all dinosaurs had. Some of them were things that theropods specifically would do. Um, theropods just being the, the mostly meat-eating um, examples, typically walking around on two legs. And like I said earlier, the first true birds appeared during the late Cretaceous. Uh, but there were a lot of different bird families during the during the Mesozoic. Um, the the diagram here kind of shows 
all the all the dinosaurs um, from the group called Solorosaurs. That's the group that includes birds. Um, and then way at the bottom is a is a whole little series of of branches, and that's the different bird families. Um, some of them, like I said, were um, most of them. A lot of them went extinct all outside the of the dinosaurs during the late Cretaceous, and then with the modern birds persisting through. Um, some of these fossil birds, um, the top corner is, um, on the left is a bird from China called Confuciornis. It um, has these like long tail um, feathers that, um, that were coming out as well. Um, it was a sm fairly small animal, only about that big. Um, the one in the top corner is called Gansus. I have some casts of Gansus fossils with me. Um, this was like a little aquatic bird, so it would have lived and looked not too different from ducks and loons today. Um, a little bit smaller overall, um, but its wings were fairly short, but they looked like, kind of like penguins may have been well designed for helping propel through the water alongside its feet. Um, so even back then, during the time of the dinosaurs, birds were already doing some of the same stuff we see them do today. Another good example being the one in the bottom left corner this one's one of my favorite fossil birds. It's called Hesperornis. This one's found, found here in North America in Kansas. Landlocked Kansas is where we find this aquatic diving bird because there would have been the western interior seaway that split the continent in two at the time. Um, so these guys were about six feet long. They were fairly large, um, living something like penguins. They were a little more, they were more primitive, maybe not quite as smart, and maybe a little meaner, who knows. Um, their bills were filled with little teeth. So unlike penguins, they, they did not just have a toothless bill. They, they did have needle sharp teeth, which would have been perfect for catching fish. Um, they lived in a very dangerous environment, so they would have had to have been tough bird, tough old birds. Um, they were living with things like mosasaurs, the big sea lizards that could get 40 plus feet long, sharks, various other dangerous predators. And they were they were successful at what they did though. Um, Hesperornis did all right for itself, all things considered. So numerous species and families of different fossil birds um, living right alongside the dinosaurs and the pterosaurs as well. Now 65 and a half, 66 million years ago, things got real ugly when the Earth experienced the mass extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous period. Alongside the dinosaurs, marine reptiles, um, flying pterosaurs, all of these animals going extinct. Birds managed to make it through, some, some families didn't, but overall the birds and the, the line that would lead to our modern birds did make it through this extinction event. Um, likely it was a combination of things like they just being very adaptable. And they were relatively small, with the exception of crocodilians who have a lot of advantages in living in water and being able to do their own version of hibernation, no large animals made it through the extinction event. Um, Pretty much anything over 25 to 50 pounds was gone. And most of the birds managed to fall on the smaller end of that threshold. Um, and just by being omnivorous and not really being too picky about what they ate or how they got it, and in some cases being able to fly to get new, new food or find uh, better environments, um, they, would have, they were able to get through that extinction event where their non-bird dinosaur cousins did not. After that, they really exploded in even more diversity. With the pterosaurs gone and the skies clear, birds had a, a wide open um, ecological niche ahead of them. And even on land, there was a number of open niches that they were curious to try out. Um, some more fossil birds that we don't have today, the top left is Pelagornis. It's a big seabird and has actually the largest wingspan of, every, of any bird in any of all time, um, approaching over 20, maybe 24 feet across, which is about twice the size of the modern day wandering albatross, our largest flying bird today, at about 11 feet across. It probably lived something like an albatross, um, you know, going across the seas and going great distances. Um, if you can see in the picture, it has these little looks like teeth. It actually didn't have teeth, but its beak had these little, almost like pseudo teeth, just these little jagged projections all along it. Um, so definitely not something you would have wanted to get bit by. Um, but Pelagornis is a good example of 
just how big birds can get. Um, other birds, there's a vulture relative called um, Argentavis. It would have also been fairly large, about with the also large wingspan, um, and still dwarfed by the pterosaurs before them, but um, still, still a massive flying animal, all things considered. Um, below the Pelagornis, we have a terror bird, which is a, a, a common nickname for a group um, that includes this animal called Titanus. This one's found, this animal's actually been found in Florida, but a lot of its relatives were found in South America. Titanus is interesting because when North America and South America connected um, with the Isthmus of Panama forming, a lot of North American animals came down into South America, but only a handful of South American animals went north. Titanus and some terror birds were, were one of the few examples, and that's why we find them in Florida today, even though most of their relatives are in South America. Titanus itself would have been about this tall, about five or six feet tall, probably weighed a couple hundred pounds, and it would have been a formidable predator with a head about that big. Big hooked beak at the end, um, big powerful legs. Um, the largest terror birds could be about eight to nine feet tall, and probably weighed in the ballpark of three to four hundred pounds. Uh, so these were some pretty serious apex predators. They were really trying their hardest to be a T-Rex. Um, not quite that big, but you know, as close to a T-Rex as a bird could get. Um, they went extinct somewhere around one and a half to two million years ago. Um, but they weren't the only large, flightless birds. Um, in the top corner, we have a skeleton of a moa, which is one of the largest birds of all time. Um, these things were probably twice the weight of a terror bird. Similar height in that ballpark of seven to nine feet, but much bigger, robust animals. But these were vegetarians. Um, they, they survived up until relatively recently. They, they, they were fairly long-lasting. Um, same goes for the one below it. Everyone's favorite, dodo bird. Dodo birds kind of get a bad reputation. They probably weren't quite the dim-witted animals that they're made out to be in a lot of media. Um, most of that just simply comes from having never encountered humans and essentially being way too trusting. And you know, they, they basically just walked up and didn't see humans as a threat and just kind of perceived that they weren't too bright because of that, because of course we are. Um, but overall, dodos getting a bad rap in the, in the brains of the So down to this very day, um, you know, our modern birds, they carry those ancient genes of their dinosaur relatives. Um, they started off fairly humble beginnings 150 million years ago in the late Jurassic, um, but then they continued to diversify into the Cretaceous. They survived the extinction event that took out their more famous cousins, and now they're the largest group of tetrapods on Earth. There are more species of birds than any other four-limbed animal. I really like the picture in the top corner of a T-Rex foot with an EU foot because if there's one way you can look at a bird and wonder, is this thing really related to a dinosaur? Just look at its foot. It is the spitting image of what you would expect to see in a predatory dinosaur, which are their closest relatives. Um, there's actually even been some studies on bird DNA to try and reverse engineer birds back into what would essentially be a little dinosaur. Um, the simple way of explaining it is that genes function kind of like light switches. You turn the right one on, you turn the right one off, and you might get a feature that you didn't expect. Um, so the idea being if you turn on the right, the, the right switches, you can get a long tail, maybe you get some teeth, maybe you get the wings to kind of go back into arms because they still have those, those, those DNA genomes in their, in their body just turned on or off. It's an interesting idea. It's definitely would take a lot of research and probably a lot of money to get to that point. <laughs> but it, it's, a, it's an interesting idea to play around. Either way, we at the end of the day, we still have dinosaurs with us, which is kind of crazy to think about. And just if I wasn't clear, birds are dinosaurs. Um, despite the many differences between them and the famous ones like T-Rex and, and Triceratops, when you compare them to ones like Velociraptor or the feathered dinosaurs, those, those similarities become super clear. They look very different on those fuzzy, feathery exteriors, but when you peel that back, you look at the details, you look at their, their skeletal structure, um, 
it, it, those, those connections become very obvious. Uh, I mentioned that three groups of you know, vertebrates were able to uh, fly, pterosaurs and birds being two. Bats are the only other uh, group of vertebrates that can fly. Um, so mammals do get some representation there. So to this day, birds are still the most successful of them. Uh, and then that's pretty much the gist of birds and flight and how we went from something along the lines of a velociraptor to something, well, like your turkey at Thanksgiving. Um, don't, just keep that in mind. Next time you get to go to KFC, you're eating a little dinosaur. Uh, or at least they claim it's, it's a real dinosaur. I'm not going to comment on the fast food industry. Um, but that leaves us with uh, plenty of time for questions. Um, I also have some casts and stuff like that. But um, if there's any questions, you can feel free to jump right in. So bird legs and dinosaur legs in, uh, in general are a little bit different than, than like what we have. Um, they're back up to a picture here. Um, so like the moa in the top, uh, top right corner, that first bone coming out of the socket, that's the femur. And then that's the, a really long tibia. Um, so that joint way up at the top, that's the knee. This like second looking backwards knee, that's the ankle. So even though there's all that stuff behind me, but below the ankle, they're, they are tiptoeing. They are walking purely on their toes. Um, that whole structure below that backwards knee or the ankle is actually their whole foot. And then they're just walking on the tips of their toes. So it would be like if we just tiptoed around and had a much longer overall foot. Um, so that's why a lot of the times it may look like a dinosaur or a bird has a backwards knee, or when that backwards knee is actually their ankle joint. Does that, does that answer your question? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, you've mentioned extinctions, different extinctions. How many have there been on these extinctions? Four or five? I believe it's about, I want to say it's five or six mass extinction events have occurred in Earth's history. Um, and some scientists will argue that we are in the midst of one right now. Um, that's a current debate that's going on, um, whether or not the number of species being lost uh, currently would qualify. Uh, but definitely, I believe it's five or six have, have officially occurred. Do they have causes for these? Most of them. Um, I don't want to spoil things too, too much for next week's um, class about the one that took out the dinosaurs, but. That one was, most cert was almost certainly caused by an asteroid impact. Um, the Permian extinction that paved the way for the dinosaurs and was the worst extinction event in her history, it took out about 90% of life. Um, it, had, it likely was caused by volcanic activity in places like Siberia, in order to just start spitting out greenhouse gases. Um, some, of them are, some of the extinction events are still being debated, but most of the time, there's a general idea of what probably caused them. Any thoughts as to how feathers evolved? Like the reasons to have them, essentially? So they first appear on relatively small dinosaurs, and the general, and because you know, the first feathers are very simple, almost quill or hair like structures, um, they would have been very downy, and they likely would have been for something to the effect of insulation. The smaller you are, the harder it is to regulate your body temperature. So to have feathers would have helped keep you warm at a small size. And then as time goes on, other, other functions like display also would have probably played a factor. Some dinosaurs and birds would have, liked, would have been able to see in color, and that's where you get bright colors and display feathers and so on and so forth. But most likely starting off as insulation, essentially. What's that? Yeah, yeah so um, modern birds can see in color and crocodilians can as well. And since dinosaurs are essentially an in-between, there's very little reason to doubt that they could have seen color as well. Um, and that's why some of them, like, uh, go back a little bit, uh, that one on the top corner of the Anchiornis has like the, the, the red on the top. Um, that was 
they were able to determine that by looking very closely at the fossils, um, that it would have had that kind of reddish feature that probably was probably for display, showing off to other Anchiornis. Um, we, we don't know exactly what color all dinosaurs were, but many of them had display structures. We think of you know, ones like the Ceratopsians, the horned dinosaurs with the big frills on the backs of their heads. Wouldn't have been all that surprising if those were brightly colored um, in order to, to show off and communicate with others of their kind. Something that they share in common with birds. Just basically, birds can be very showy. I mean, you look at a peacock or a bird of paradise, and they have all sorts of crazy displays. Dinosaurs, uh, they, kind of, they pretty much invented that, and birds just took it with them and ran with it. <laughs> uh, when I was young, we always used to think of dinosaurs, and we didn't think too much about dinosaurs when I was young, that they were cold-blooded. Mm -hmm. And then somewhere along the way, they gradually began to say, no, they were not cold-blooded. What convinced them? So things like studying their, their anatomy, um, and finding that connection to birds. Um, there was a time period in the 60s and 70s that so was kind of referred to as a dinosaur renaissance, and that's when paleontologists really started to kind of reevaluate how they, you know, the, the general perception of dinosaurs, and that's where you started getting that switch from being cold-blooded, sluggish creatures to warm-blooded, more active creatures. Um, the connections with birds, more of these smaller bird-like dinosaurs um, being found and named helped clear that up, and then when you look at things like their, their bone structure, the, the way that they're built a lot more like birds and mammals than they are traditional reptiles would suggest that they were living an active lifestyle that a cold-blooded nature couldn't, couldn't support. Um, the general consensus now is that dinosaurs pretty much fell somewhere between cold-blooded and warm-blooded. It's not so black and white, it's more of a sliding scale with a lot of gray areas in between. Some dinosaurs, like the big sauropod long necks, were just so enormous that they would have experienced gigantothermy, which is just, they were so big, they just keep themselves warm by being huge. Um, we see that with great white sharks and large sea turtles, even though they are from traditionally cold-blooded groups, they're just so big that they can hold their temperature you know, much more efficiently. Um, small dinosaurs, because they couldn't do that and were more bird-like, they were probably true warm-blooded endotherms. Um, where they generated their own body heat, and then others were, again, kind of, they could regulate it, but maybe not quite as efficiently as mammals or modern birds can. Um, so, like I said, not so black and white, but some were probably kind of in between. Is there any way to know how long an extinction took place, or how long it took for a species to become extinct? It's a little bit tricky to kind of determine that. Um, usually you can, you'll can you see just a general gap in the fossil record um, where there's just very little, not to say that, you know, obviously not, not everything would go extinct or an extinction event, there would always be survivors, um, but there would be a general gap because there's so few animals that it might, um, so like with the Permian extinction, if it took place, to, it took place about 250 million years ago, uh, the first, fossils after that don't appear for about another one to two million years. That's not to say that the extinction lasted that long, but it may have taken that long for life to recover to the point where things could become fossilized. Because to become fossilized, you have to have really good odds. Uh, you know, a small population will likely mean nothing's going to get fossilized. So you have to hit a certain kind of threshold at that point in order to have any representation in the fossil record. Um, but extinction events could last any time. It really just depends. Some of them may have lasted only a, hand, a couple of months. If it was a rapid one, like an asteroid impact, that could have just been within a couple of a couple of months to a year or two. The long-lasting ones, like the Permian, where it's just pumping out greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, that could have taken thousands of years to fully take effect. Yeah, I was, I was wondering, if, you know, a slow extinction does that impact any of the remaining animals moving bones around and that sort of thing? It would just really depend on what kind of event it was. If it's if it was a if it was a slow death scenario where it's basically just long term climate change from from those kinds of like greenhouse gases, that probably wouldn't affect things too much. But if you're talking earthquakes or volcanic eruptions, that could, in theory, sure uh, stir things up a little bit. Yeah. 
So all birds are dinosaurs. All birds are dinosaurs. It could be. There are there. I mean, even humans. There are definitely a number of species who are critically endangered and likely going extinct as we speak. Um, literally, just yesterday, I believe it was, there was um, an article about dugongs in in China showing that the Chinese population is functionally extinct. They haven't been spotted. I think it's since 2008. Now, that's not to say dugongs are extinct, but that population of them is gone. And that's the kind of thing that, if it happens in other areas, could lead to a whole species going. Um, you know, things like climate change aren't anything, it's not necessarily new. Um, you know, that's part of Earth's cycles, but there's definitely a, uh, a rapid acceleration of it that could definitely be causing some issues for a number of species. Not could, it definitely is causing a number of issues for species today. There's, a, there's definitely some, some argument to be had for there. <laughs> the, right. It's when you start talking about things like deep time and animals and creatures before us, it, it's really humbling and as to set it, you know, as to be a reminder that wow, we are you know that much on a scale that's hard to even fathom. And so I think that something as powerful as a Tyrannosaurus rex, you know, the dinosaurs, the most famous, successful group of extinct animals, even they got theirs. It's like, ooh, it's kind of a scary thought. Very. It definitely takes time. Um, it's a little hard to track on the fossil record just because so few animals, relatively speaking, do fossilize. So that even even rel even animals we've determined are close relatives still have a lot of time between them. Oftentimes, you know, maybe not ten million years, but thousands of years possibly. Um, you know, you can find one T. Rex skeleton in a spot ten feet away. You can find another, but they're ten thousand years apart. Um, so it's a little tricky to track the exact changes that would have taken place during those adapt when they adapt to their environment and things like that. Um, generally speaking, a species will usually last only around one to three million years before a new one shows up and takes its place. It's probably somewhere in that general ballpark, um, but it, it take, definitely takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. I really hope we don't need those things, or else I'm going to be upset I had to be put under to get my wisdom teeth out, because that was a miserable two weeks. <laughs> Doesn't the extinction have a domino effect that a species goes extinct, and that species predators now has no food? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you, if you eliminate even one animal or plant from its environment, the, the domino effect is, is very real. It's definitely more of a, it's, again, it's not a black and white, but you know, the wolves in Yellowstone are a good example of how different the environment can change when you remove the apex predator from it. The, you know, the elk population explodes and the beavers are impacted and so on and so forth. So yeah, just taking even just one creature away or one, one type of plant away will absolutely affect, will affect one thing and that will affect the other thing and the other thing and the other thing until everyone's affected. It's all, it's all interconnected. Has there been any example, say within the last year, of any animal changing besides that? In what? You know, like adapting a different way, like take a mouse, you know, just changing mm -hmm. it all. For humans, it's really hard to see that because 
even throughout entire human history, we're still, like we were saying, relatively brief on here. Um, so it's hard to really observe that truly with your own eyes. In some cases, um, some scientists will argue that you see animals hy like hybrid hybridizing. That could be an example of them adapting. Um, some polar bears have been some have been observed mating with grizzly bears and creating viable offspring. Could that be an example of them adapting? Maybe it's kind of up to up for debate, but that 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 would be one way to kind of one of many ways that you could potentially observe it with your own eyes. Um, Darwin's finches are a, are a famous example um, at the Galapagos Islands where on each island they were adapted to eating their own. They were all genetically very similar but with just a little bit of change in their in their beak structure depending on what they were eating. Uh, so he didn't necessarily observe them obviously like changing, changing in front of them, but he went from island to island like, okay, this one, they're all more or less similar except this one thing and it's being driven by their food sources. And even, even in some cases, you know, animals are incredibly adaptable. The you know, wolves in the northern hemisphere, up, up further north, tend to be larger than those in the south because the south, southern ones have been adapted to a hotter climate where being big might not be as advantageous. Um, that's not necessarily changing into a new species, but it's a good, strong example of, of at the very least, adapting to your environment, which can have long-term effects in theory. Birds, um, I kind of touched on this a little bit last week. Birds, birds are really interesting in that they heal incredibly quickly. If they have an injury, they they heal that real quick. Um, and that's where dinosaurs also probably healed quickly. We have dinosaurs with broken leg bones or broken tail bones, but they're so bone growth that they kept going afterwards. It takes time for bone to heal, so the fact that they were that that didn't kill them immediately says something. Um, yeah. There's a lot of lessons to be learned from, from the natural world. Yeah. Well, if there's no other questions, yeah. yeah. And then like I said, I got lots of lots of bird and dinosaur bird relative um, stuff up here if you want to check anything out in particular. <laughs>